part and it becomes something that's even political. Right. And, and people don't realize that not only does that person in there suffer, the family suffers with them. And we try our best to just educate people and help them to understand that, um, you know, it's not just the person going to jail that suffers. It's even the family that suffers. I, I can remember when my brother, when they convicted him, the father turned around and looked at my stepfather and said, I do not believe that your son killed my daughter. It was just, it, you know, it's so, it's so many factors that they use that have nothing to do with the cases sometimes. Um, my brother got convicted around the time when O.J. Simpson um, was free, and a lot of people retaliated because of that. My brother yeah. had a white wife. There was like so many other things. Everybody on the stand perjured themselves. My, my brother never took the stand. They had evidence that did not uh, point towards him, and the prosecutor decided that he didn't want to seek any more evidence. He had his hooks like sunk in him, and that was it. And a lot of times that happens that they feel like you don't have the family support or they feel like you don't have the money. A lot of times they just, just railroad you if they can. You know, the prisoner can't smile, the prisoner can't frown, the prisoner can't do anything, and anything that they do do is held against them. And so many things happen wrong. But again, like I said, um, once, he, once your loved one is in the system, it's hard to basically get them out. Yeah. And uh, me and Charity, we, we talk about this a lot, the how so many people, if it's not happening to them, if they're not familiar with it, um, like you said, you don't think about it. Right. You don't think about it. And it wasn't until she actually met my brother and formed a relationship with him and actually in meeting me that she probably began to sympathize more and just really listen in. And mm -hmm. then as, as she got to know him on her own, she was just like, whoa. And then when we got the transcripts and we just started reading through them, because I know for a lot of us, it's hard going through those transcripts and you praying to God that you don't see something that you don't want to see because, right. <laughs> you know, you're praying to God. They're saying that they're innocent, but, you know, is are they really innocent? Right. And I can remember just combing through those transcripts, transcripts with charity. We had seen them. They had been with me for years. And I was just afraid to go through them. I know what I saw. I know what I heard. I know what he said. Um, but I was just afraid. And we got to combing through stuff. And I was just like, oh, my goodness. Oh my goodness, he is not guilty. I mean, and it just felt so good, you know, just to have somebody else there fighting with me. Right. Even my family, even my mom, everybody's just tired. They they fizzled out real quick. And especially once a verdict uh, tells you you're guilty, there sometimes even family starts questioning, like, are you guilty really though? Because why right. would they convict you? Yeah. Right, and that's the narrative that people um, always um, believe. That um, someone did something, like you did something, and and I want people to know that you don't have to do anything. <laughs> um, they took my brother, and I don't want people to know that you don't have to do anything. That's right. Right. They took my brother to the crime scene, um, on a traffic warrant and tried to get him to get out of the car. It was like a setup from the beginning. And then you had these prosecutors and how they set these cases up. I mean, it was like they were looking for anything. They got stuck, they wanted it to be him. They knew they did some things wrong, so they had to figure out how to convict him. I mean, it's just so sad when I think about the cases. So me, me and Charity sat down and we just kind of came up with some things um, to just kind of like, help you or anybody else that's kind of going through the same things we're going through so that we can stay encouraged. So they came up with four things that we felt was very important um, when it comes to family dealing with people who are wrongfully uh, convicted. So the first thing we came up with was family support. Yeah. We get people to stand up and help organize with us. The more people listen, the more people are aware. Yeah, because when, when we found like Charity, um, when Charity's finding out about a lot of these marches and stuff that is going on, sometimes it's a day that it's happening. It may be an inconvenient day, but mm -hmm. when she goes, there's not a whole lot of people there. And there needs to be just as many people that are standing up talking about gun rights. We need to have that many people standing up talking about uh, prisoner rights, talking about, you know, just standing up for the prisoner and just remembering what the Bible says that we're not supposed to forget the prisoner. Because that's another thing. There are even people in jail who are not wrongfully convicted, but their sentencing is just ridiculous. Wow. And that's even illegal. But right. if we don't know over incarceration, over, yeah. over sentence. 
Yeah, yeah, no, big deal. And, and especially in Michigan, that happens a lot. Mm -hmm. And if we don't have support, you know, people to come in and just like stand up or tell us, you know, who to go to, who to talk to, what to look out for, they basically railroad people. So it's important that even us that, you know, we stay connected and keep each other encouraged because when our loved ones are doing time, it's like we're doing time too. I got cheated out of a whole brother. That's like, yeah. my brother is in my heart. The rest of my brothers are out, but this brother is still in there. He didn't even have children. Wow. You know, it's like, wow. it's, it's hard and we need each other. When women are in jail, when men are in jail, we need that type of support to keep us going. I remember telling my brother one time, I was like, man, I wish you were dead. It would just be easier if you were dead. Wow. And, and I'm just being honest. And I mean, me and him talked on the phone and we were just kind of like crying because my brother was my protector. He's my heart. And now he's in there and I can't, I don't have the resources to, you know, and so meeting charity, having somebody to fight that battle with me is just great because my parents and a lot of people, they done, they done went their own way. So I feel like, I'll be, and now my brothers, he's in a battle with us now. <laughs> it's been a long journey. So that family support is important. Um, and making sure that we go to the rallies and we support each other, even if there's not any family support. I don't care if a person is guilty, they still need family support. We Absolutely. got to get behind each other, make phone calls, say, hey, are you going up there? Do you need somebody to go with, right. with you? Can I check on you just to say, hey, and see how you're doing? How right. your loved one is holding up? Okay, can is it all right if I write your loved one? Do they need anything? Because all the times we don't have money all the time. But right. maybe you do have some extra cash you could throw to somebody else just to keep them encouraged. Okay, so that was the first thing, family support. The next thing is um, just making sure that you know who your local politician and, and legislators are. Absolutely. So get to know who your state prosecutors are, who those public defenders are. A lot of times they are overworked. So it's important that if we have information on stuff, we can help them out and get information to them. Um, get to know who the judges are inside of the communities, right? Get mm -hmm. to find out who those judges are and what their records are. Because a lot of times when we're voting for people, we don't know who the judges are. So we get this, we 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 get the um the ballot, and we're trying to pick people who look black or look like somebody of our ethnicity, somebody that we think will be fair. Oh, this seems like a friendly name, so let me pick them. But we don't know their records. Right, and that's um, something we're going to talk about later on about the judges. That is a big deal. We have to um, Google. The, we have Google. Google these people and learn their records. And then, uh, yeah, and then the other thing that we have, and Charity's going to go on to the next one, but the other thing that we have is finding out who the local officers are inside of the community. Mm -hmm. you will be shocked at who will help your case because sometimes these officers they don't want to tell them each other or talk about somebody else's case but you'll be surprised that who will help you out or give you information that right. you need to know maybe some laws that you need to know also finding out who the community leaders are because mm -hmm. there are a bunch of support groups things that i didn't even know about because my charity has been so involved in this fight yeah that I, i've yeah. been finding out so many things that i had no idea about and also getting to know your neighbors in the community because yeah. these are people that can step up when somebody does come in and try to convict your loved one. You need that support. So start talking to people and letting them know what's going on because you will be surprised. I've met so many people since living in Michigan. I'm from Illinois. Um, I didn't know God was going to bring me back to Michigan, but I know it's all for a reason. But I've met so many people now who have now decided to fight for my brother. That's the white party that can help us right. so um charity you yeah. number three number three we just need to understand the law and we need to if we see something we need to say something yes. that's everybody has an accountability here everybody our neighbors our community everywhere um if you have time sit in on cases yes. take notes learn what they're doing in our court system to these people um look up cases um you Go know. to local libraries, educate yourself on what you can do to help familiarize yourself with the state law yeah. and um, be a voice. Because yeah. yeah. so many of us, we don't all know, and it takes a lot. You know, when you just have one or two people trying to fight for one person, we need community. We need our neighbors. We need our, our people in our states and our counties getting together to help. Yes. And then the last thing that we have is just to remember the prisoner as well as the victims, because that's the other side of this, right? right. There was a young lady in my brother's case that lost her life. She has children. Right. She had a family. And, and sometimes we can't be so involved or, you know, so 
go into, I want to free, you know, my brother or my loved one that I, I disregard that other person. So these life God's taking. And I pray that one day I am able to sit face to face with her father or her family and talk to them like, you know, my brother did during the sentencing. And he was like, mm -hmm. I am, I am so sorry. You know, that's, those kids lost their mom. Somebody is a victim in this. And, um, we can't forget that, you know, we can't forget about forgiveness and love and just extending those things because when we extend grace and mercy and we let go of that anger, God in turn blesses us. Yeah. And I believe that this is a big lesson in forgiveness. Like you said, yes. you lost, your son is in there. Yes. And, oh, man, right. when I hear my brother talking about forgiveness and loving people, it just softens my heart even more, understanding that those people behind bars, whether guilty or not guilty, they're human beings. Right. You know, and, and forgiveness so the, is the key. Uh, it helps us get moved forward yes. no matter what's going on. Yes. So thank you. I thank you guys so much. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate your story. Uh, I'm going to go next to Dina. Hi, Dina. Hi, Jay. Can, can you guys hear me okay? Oh, yeah, we hear you well. So just, okay, well, um, good evening. Uh, yes. Tell us about um, your um, wrongful conviction journey. Okay. Well, I just want to start out by saying in regards to what you stated earlier, Jay and um, Charity, I totally agree with those things that you said. This has been a very hurtful, very trying time for me. Um, very difficult. Um, on this wrongful conviction day, which I had never knew about a wrongful conviction day to just several months ago, I'm still trying to learn and be more educated on this journey. Um, because it's very difficult, as you all know. Yes. So can you tell us about your, um, a little bit about your son and um, how? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, for those that don't know, my name is Thea Clark. And um, I have a son that is wrongfully incarcerated on a second degree murder. My son was sentenced to 18 to 24 years, and my son's name is Stephen Foster. And um, I am speaking out today to bring awareness and truth about my son's case. There is many and so many flaws within my son's case. And the number one, is the misidentification. Mm. Um, there was lies of uncreditable people that spoke against my son wrongfully. Mm -hmm. The former um, Judge Vonda Evans had convicted my son of being guilty of taking a life. With no evidence supporting the charge, only misconduct, from the detectives that engaged in an unethical practice. Um, my son was on probation and he had reported to his PO officer. And after reporting to his um, PO officer, he got a phone call from her stating that she needed for him to report to her like within ASAP, within an hour's time frame. Mm -hmm. which my son did report on time, only to be handcuffed and charged to a murder that had took place over a year prior, back in 2015. I just want to ask and say this, if you committed murder, would you report? Oh, no. No. <laughs> so um, this took place four years ago at Frank Murphy, and that's where the corruption started. Wow. Um, <clears throat> there was a man that told the DA that he saw my son standing on a corner 
but I had no support and evidence putting my son anywhere in the area of the crime. Mm -hmm. And there was no weapon. So in closing, I just want to say that how does one get convicted? I just want to bring awareness that the criminal system is broken and it's unfair and it's unjust. My heart is heavy. I am hurting. My son is hurting. And we need some justice. And so does the family and the mother that lost their son. Mm -hmm. I am speaking out on this wrongful conviction day because it's our truth. My son and others are in prison wrongfully due to the lack of the integrity of our law officials. And like my son stated, the day when he was sentenced, that the system sent an innocent man to prison. I just want to thank you, Jay, for giving me the opportunity to speak again. And I am grateful that I have met you and some other wonderful people on this journey with this wrongful conviction. People don't know the suffering and the pain that we go through on this journey. Yes on a daily basis. Yes. Thank you so much, Dina, for sharing your story, your journey. I know as a mother, I know that feeling. I talked to Gerard today and I can hear pain in his voice. Yes. And so, you know, um, I just have to keep encouraging him and I'm encouraging you and charity. Yes. We just have to stay, keep the fight up and, um, our kids will be free so yes thank you thank you thank you drew hi hi so you're our uh last impact story and i want you to tell us how um about your wrongful conviction journey and um and you know um how it happened and you know what do you have to share with us I was uh, wrongfully convicted basically because I was there, pretty much what they said, mere presence. Mm -hmm. Not that I did anything, I didn't commit the crime, I didn't do the shooting, but the system, the judge felt that because I was the one that had the education, including college education, that I must have been the ringleader. Mm -hmm. My defendants, like defendants do, tried to say that I said this, I did that. Even the uh, individual that had gotten hit with the bullet said that he heard me say shoot him or something or other. The misrepresentation public def uh, court appointed attorney who was definitely overworked and underpaid, which is a huge problem. Yeah. As I stated yesterday, he, could, he couldn't remember who I was each time he came to court, he had to ask who he was looking for. Many times he had me confused with somebody else. There were times where he had left my entire file in another courtroom. No court was not like anything that I had previously seen on TV or movies or anything. There were no objections by my attorney. He basically just sat there wow. the whole time. And all he would continue to tell me was that you were just there Mere presence is not enough to be convicted by, and don't worry about it. They can't convict you. They can't convict you. And at 21, I had no clue. I had police officers who had made up their mind that they were going to get somebody. As I had stated before, I heard my attorney and the prosecutors in the hallway, the prosecutor let him know, can't lose four people on this case. It's four defendants. He said, we got to have at least three of them. And... They went with, they got 
one defendant to admit to everything that he was involved with and he had a paid attorney, he managed to get found not guilty. They convicted the shooter, they convicted the young lady, and they convicted me basically as an accessory, although the crime says it's three counts of assault with intent to commit murder. But the judge said it's as an accessory because I didn't do anything to prevent the crime and I didn't do anything afterwards. Mm. I don't know what they exactly expected me to do afterwards which resulted in me spending 14 years in prison. And uh, Sam Riddleman was talking about something earlier that I hope gets uh, pushed through. They're working on, a lot of times what Michigan do, they'll give you several counts and put them as one in on one case. So I got three counts on that case. So when it comes to getting expungement, although I don't have a problem with the conviction because of the time frame, this was 1989, been a lot of time passed and I don't have much dealing with the background but I never went with the expungement because I would have only got, I was eligible to get one felony expunged and still would have left the other two. Right. So they're working now to get something where multiple expungements, if you've got several counts on one case, you can get them all expunged at the same time because it really makes no sense to go get one felony expunged and you still have two. Right, I think uh, uh, um uh, I'm, I'm sure Hakeem will talk about this a little bit later. Um, I think it's called One Bad Night or something like that, where um, um, all of those issues from that conviction would be uh, expunged instead of just one thing. So we'll talk about it a little later, I'm sure. But yeah. Um, um, wow. But so the way the, 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 the way the system play, I mean, you, you, you're not a person to them. Your case number, your goal. I mean, if it's a serious crime, children involved or something, they want to get somebody. Right. A lot of times, whoever they can, whoever they come up with, they roll the dice, and that's who we, we got you. We're gonna make it you some kind of way. And when they when they and they investigating and talking to you, I mean, I could hear them talking to the other defendants. They gave the young lady. I mean, they bought her McDonald's and pop. And they talked to her and they told her how we know you scared. They, she was having a conversation before we got arrested. We were at my house and I could hear her upstairs on the phone. I thought she was talking to her mother. She was, the police were at her mother's house and she was talking to her and they were telling her, she told me later, they were telling her, you know, we know it's not you. We know it's them. It's the two guys. We want to get them guys. Just help us out. Tell us where you at. And it's like they, they play us against one another. Right. And we may agree because you're scared. Right. You know, if it's a woman that has children, they throw threaten you with you know you're gonna lose your kids. You're not gonna see your kids. They're gonna take the kids from you. You gotta do it. And that's why I tell them all the time. Everybody talk about you know my homeboys will never tell. Them. Look, once they get you, that 48 hours kills me every time I watch it because you see how quick people will turn. Right. You can't get squoze. I Sometimes I think I was dumb not to take the deal. They offered me a two to five. The only condition was that I made sure that I convicted the other three. But somehow my mind said, no, I'm, I'm not going to help y'all convict anybody. And he was like, you get a two to five, you'll probably do eight, nine months. Now what they do now, because it's such a money grab, they will send people up to Jackson just to get a number, just to get a number. I've seen guys come through, just come up there and spend less than 48 hours up there. They just go straight to a parole camp. They just want them to get a number so they can get that, get that body count, get that money for it. And you spoke about it. It's privatized now right. more so. And it's really a money grab now. It's all about we represent dollars. It's just a modern day slave system. Yeah, you're right. So I want to bring... Um... Reverend Ed Pinkley and Trisha and Hakeem in on this conversation. Um, thank you, Drew. Um, as you listen to these stories, what goes across your mind? Mm -hmm. Trisha, Hakeem, Reverend Ed Pinkley. Because Absolutely. of corruption, that's what goes across my mind. You know, if you think about in the state of Michigan, 48.9% of wrongful convictions are due to prosecutor misconduct. Yeah. How does it start? Out of all of your stories, I heard one common theme, the officer. So it starts with the officer drumming up these bold charges because they just want to get somebody. 
Right. Then they take it to a prosecutor who's overzealous and who thrives on a conviction rate. Exactly. And there's a prosecutor I know, I won't call her name, but she celebrates, I have a 98% uh, conviction rate. And I asked her, I said, and you're celebrating that? Mm -hmm. I said, and I hope you don't have any wrongful convictions under her belt. We'll come to find out she does. Right. You know, so it's all about a number. It's all about the wrong thing. It's not about justice. And especially when you think about African-Americans, Come on now, the Constitution declared us three-fifths less of a person, right? Yeah. And so they continue to treat us with such disrespect. And I, I had a conversation with somebody the other day that said, while we were fighting for civil rights, really we should have included or been fighting for human rights. Right. Because as long as these individuals do not see us as human beings, they will continue to treat us as less than. And I just want to say to you ladies, I love you all. Um, you know, we've been fighting for a while together and we will continue to stand arm in arm against this system that acts like it doesn't want to bring us justice. So we will continue to fight. Absolutely. So, um, Trisha, while you're on here, introduce yourself. <laughs> I'm so sorry. You know what? I get so passionate. <clears throat> you know what? It's about wrongful conviction because, man, it's just people are suffering. I think it was Miyoshe and um, Charity that said it. When you convict someone, you convict the entire family. Absolutely. And so, you know, that's my passion comes from. But my name is Trisha Duckworth. I am the executive director and founder of Survivor Speak. And Wrongful Conviction is one of our top um, platforms as to us wanting to bring awareness as well as bring families together so that we can all support one another in this fight. Okay. Thank you, Trisha. So I want to go next to um, Hakeem. Could you... Um... Tell us your thoughts, introduce yourself. Good evening, good evening everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining. Um, unfortunately, I, I had to mention this, that I'm monitoring it live on Facebook and it's, the feed is very interrupted. I have it on two different screens and right now it's not even playing live. Um, okay. So we have some little technical difficulties. Perhaps Jay, you can check your connection and see is it, uh, is it fully connected and, and, and straighten that out so that no one is disconnected from hearing us. Okay. Um, nonetheless, uh, my name is Hakeem Crampton. Um, I work for Just Leadership USA, a national criminal justice leadership and advocacy organization based in New York. Um, I myself am wrongly convicted. I spent 15 years of a 45 year sentence uh, uh, from 1991 to 2006 of a wrongful conviction. Um, so all of these stories uh, that I've heard um, are very familiar to me, you know, having sat in prison for 15 years, hearing the other stories uh, of people who are incarcerated like myself, um, and seeing the fight, and not having advocacy, uh, and I'm talking about in the 90s, I went to prison in 1991 at the age of 18, not having advocacy except for someone like you, a parent, a mother, right, whose voice was, what was, 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 was loud, but it wasn't projected uh, and supported in a way that would produce the kind of results that we see today with social media, with online petitions, um, with so many revelations of so many people being uh, uh, released uh, post wrongful convictions, right? And so, you know, it, it's very critical today that we are doing things like this on International Wrongful Conviction Day, um, that we are having conversations uh, about centering how do we uh, not only contend with a criminal legal system um, that by design is structurally uh, biased towards people of color uh, and other marginalized groups, but how do we contend with, within that system that we're fighting with, how do we then pinpoint very uh, uh, specific portions of the system that must be immediately addressed, right? Like the whole system has to be addressed. But we're talking about wrongful convictions, and Trisha pointed out, you know, both prosecution and the, the police department played the, 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 the crucial role in how uh, the genesis of someone's wrongful conviction occurs. And so when that police contact happens and that report is beginning to be generated from that interrogation, from the first evidence collected, prior to it even being handed over to the prosecution, we have serious problems with police forces, with detectives, with investigations. That's where we must begin having this conversation at the, at the criminal legal system uh, confrontation because the police department is a part of the criminal legal system. They are a wing of it. 
They are the, 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 the very beginning stages of the criminal legal system. They are charged and tasked with enforcing law and detaining people who break the law and then bringing them to uh, the, the, the court system who would then adjudicate and determine uh, guilt or innocence uh, regarding that particular case. So we have to have that conversation uh, about law enforcement. You see what happened in Washtenaw County just recently. The equity report demonstrated both in Washtenaw County and as well in Ingham County, that there's huge biases of both prosecution and criminal arrest, right? The contact that police officers are having. So this conversation we're having today is critical. Uh, and it's critical to have the voices that are at this table, um, to have lawyers at the table, to have people that have been directly impacted, to have advocates and people like uh, us that are working within this criminal justice field to give uh, some kind of uh, perspective that is, th that is the perspective that has been missing from the table all this time. People who have been addressing and having conversations about wrongful convictions have not had the kind of input uh, that is now at the table and now here with us tonight. So thank you for having this conversation. And thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Reverend Ed Pinkney. Hey, how you doing? I'm, I'm, hey, 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 I, I, I'm excited. I mean, I, I, I see what's, what's going on and, and, and it's, it's really extremely hard to get people together to talk about stuff like this, unless something happens to them. One of the things that I have always did, I have been court watching since 1999, and I did it religiously because I knew people didn't know. I knew that people didn't understand the system. I knew that everything went on. It was a strong possibility if you get arrested, most likely you was going to get convicted. And uh, I myself, uh, three times I have been to prison, and three times uh, my case was overturned, uh, which never happens, not in, in a modern day, not with a black person anyway. But I, but it's, it's the case where you know. What I used to do, we used to have classes every Saturday for about 10 years trying to teach people uh, uh, about the law so that they can be prepared. A lot of times, people don't get even involved with the criminal justice system unless something happens to them right. and then it's too late. Right. You, you know, you, you have to be prepared and know what you're doing. Even when you go out and get you a paid lawyer, most of the time these paid lawyers, all they want, to do, want you to do is plead guilty. They don't care nothing really about you. They only care about uh, uh, you plead guilty and this is what they will do. And this is what we was teaching people how to survive more or less. And we won more cases than, than the court appointed attorney, than the paid lawyers. We won when, when, those, when they listen. A lot of times people just don't listen. They don't want to hear it. They believe the white man or they believe you and you're supposed to know. But this is what we do and how we did things. And, uh, uh, and, and, and believe me, what we have to do now, we have to start educating our community, you yeah. see. It, it, the more we educate the community, the stronger we get. Yeah. And that's how we got strong down here. See, we're, we're not a pushover when it comes to that court system down there. We're running. That's why they had to get rid of me because they figured it was, if, if I get rid of Pinckney, we can eliminate all this other and continue doing business as usual. But you don't do business as usual when you have a strong organization that's supporting you and behind you. When I went to prison uh, this last time, I received over 22,000 letters. People wrote me from all, you know, what can, I'm in prison and they asking me, what can I do? Uh, how can you help my son? How could you help my husband? How could you help my daughter? This is what I heard while I was in prison. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, but, but, but make it even more amazing than that, we have to get this together. Right now, right now we're, we're, we're doing something that's so amazing, that's so amazing that, uh, that that we have we put in for 23 commutations, 23. Wow. And we got 18 people released that have served a total, a total of 43 years. And, 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 and that's, that's what we was doing. Uh, and the way we did it, see, you have to know what you're doing. If you don't know what you're doing, then you, you, you see, they'll run over you. Mm -hmm. This system is designed to eat you up. Because one thing, you don't have the money to fight. I was fortunate to have money to fight back. I was fortunate. Everybody is not me. 
but I knew what I had to do and I knew what I had to do in order to be successful. But I like to teach people about the law, uh, how, to, how to deal with the law system and also to help them during the trial. See, when you talk about people being released uh, on the, um, uh, uh, you know, on a commutation, it's almost a miracle, you know, when people get released on a commutation, especially in the state of Michigan, it's, it's a miracle just about. But if you have the right equipment, if you have the right financing, we'll put, we put up the money to help people get released. And we don't ask the family for money because that's how you separate them from their family. They may not even want them to come home. But what we do, we make sure that we have something stable for this person so when he get out, he'll be able to move forward. Yeah. And that's why it's so important. We're working on a case right now. This guy has done 45 years in prison. And uh, we're going to bring him home by December. He is almost a case with there. But what I like to teach people and what I like to say to people, we have to start educating our community, informing about, let's do something before something happens. Let's not wait until something happens and then want to fight. It's too late. Right. Fight before things happen and have a strong union like the girl that lives next door to you she might say well nothing is ever going to happen to my son nothing ever going to happen to my daughter nothing ever going to happen to my husband she might say that you know but in reality she never know i'm gonna give you the one quick thing that i'm gonna i'm gonna, I'm gonna let you let like, this one lady she had two sons one had just got his grad he had just graduated from grad school got his degree she said oh my son ain't and the other one was about to graduate from college. And we was picking in the courthouse. And we said, well, come on out here and pick it with us. She said, oh, I ain't gonna, I am, I'm never going to you know, do none of this stuff. I'm never going to be, uh, uh, what called, my sons ain't going, ain't nothing going to ever happen to them. And guess what? Both of her sons ended up in prison. And she wow. said, and then she came and want to apologize. I said, well, you don't have to apologize. This is something that happened. Never, never, ever say that it can't happen to me. Right. It, it, you know, and, 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 and believe me, this is what we have to teach people and educate them because you could be driving home by yourself and they playing a gun in your car saying that you kiss somebody, then you're going to prison. Yeah, it That's can all they need. Yeah, and that and that's important. It can happen to anyone, right? At any time, it doesn't any matter um, and, and, who and, you and, are. And when you say wrongful conviction, you know you can go in the courtroom, and, and and knowing that you like all my cases, there was that I did nothing wrong, but they convicted me three times, all white juries three times. But I just told them, like I told them, I'll be back, you know. Because I know, you know, someone was going to be fortunate enough to get the Supreme Court did it once, the Court of Appeal two times, and very seldom do it happen, but we did it. But this is my message to everybody: let's organize, let's start doing it before something happens, and don't wait until something happens. Go talk to your neighbor, go talk to them, tell them. You know, yeah. hey, you don't have to come out every day. You don't have if you can come out just on a Saturday for one hour. Right. That's all. Right. So that's, yeah. What Sam said when we organize, he said all the time, when we organize, we win. That's right. And when you <laughs> organize, and look, if, if if you organize, you can beat them down, yeah. you know, and and, and 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 be for real about it. Yeah. And and, and don't be intimidated by this system. Because this system will eat you up if you let them. Yeah. So you have to stand strong and make sure it does not happen. Yes. If you got something for me, bring it on. That's what I say. And yeah. I'm the type of guy who said, uh, uh, I'll take it to trial. I'll take it to trial. I'll take a hamburger to trial if necessary. <laughs> Just take, I'll take it to trial because I believe that even if these folks convict me that I know that I didn't do something, I'm going to win the case eventually. Yeah. And, but it, you have to have resources too. So that's important. Well, speaking of trial and resources, we have attorney, uh, attorney Victoria Burton Harris with us. And uh, hi, um, hi. <laughs> can you introduce her? Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hello there. Hi, how, how is everybody? Yeah, I'm doing great. <laughs> Good, you fired up and you got me fired up. I needed coffee earlier, but I think I'm oh. done with this caffeine. <laughs> 
between Hakeem and Trisha <laughs> and Reverend Pink. I think I'm okay now. <laughs> yeah, all right. Well, I tell you this, it's going down. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> I love to hear all three of you all speak. Mm -hmm. For those that don't know me, I'm Victoria Burton Harris. I'm a criminal defense attorney uh, in Detroit. And I don't like to stop there. Um, I think that criminal defense is one of the things that I do, but I prefer to call myself a movement lawyer. Um, mm -hmm. I am not ashamed to say I'm a black woman, black mama and a black wife with a law degree. And I believe in fighting for black liberation. Um, my, uh, some of my friends have asked, you know, do you think that that's appropriate for you to say that you fight for black liberation? you should be fighting for all people. And I say, absolutely, mm. absolutely. Because Black folks haven't been free in this country since we were brought here, packed into the bottoms of ships. Mm. For 400 years, we have been enslaved. When we were brought here, we were enslaved. Once we got out of slavery, we went into a Jim Crow era. And then once we got out of Jim Crow, we went into mass incarceration. And the entire time, a document this American constitution, the black cabinet. I haven't mm -hmm. read that, but mm -hmm. I am interested. Drop that in the chat so that I can order that on Amazon. Mm -hmm. When we look at our constitution and we see that there is the 13th amendment that allows continued slavery in response to crime. And then you look at how black folks are overrepresented in the American prison system. You see that we are still enslaved, right? And you see that this is like Brother Hakeem said, a systemic problem that feasts, you know, the system it feasts on black bodies. It relies on black bodies for economic benefit for this country. And so I'm not ashamed when I say that I fight for black liberation and I feel like that is my purpose um, in this black skin with this degree. And mm -hmm. I, I implore people to examine where we've been before mm -hmm. we devise a plan on how we're going to get to where we want to go because you have to know your history. You have mm -hmm. to know that the history of police in America was to control black folks. Mm -hmm. You have to understand that you will never see anything different from police unless we're going to get to a point where we no longer use police for the ways in the ways that we use them now. We're going to continue to have those problems. So I don't expect more from the police. Mm -hmm. I do expect more from our prosecutors. Our prosecutors mm -hmm. are the gatekeepers to our criminal justice system. So if police, because we know that they will lie in reports, we know that they will do half-assed jobs in their investigations. Lawyers, when I take a case as a defense attorney, I just got um, a capital murder case, first degree murder. I have a duty to investigate. What did I do? I immediately hired an investigator for that case. Start talking to all of these witnesses before they disappear for me, please. If I don't do that, I am in violation of my ethical duties as a member of the bar. Well, prosecutors are members of the bar. They have an ethical obligation to investigate the truth, the veracity of these claims that are brought to them by the police. They should not just simply have a police report presented to them and body cam footage that they don't even look at that more than likely will contradict what's written in the police reports. And then they just simply rubber stamp and authorize these warrants. And they just continue to funnel our people through the criminal injustice system. Right. So I, I really, um, and I know we're going to get more into this in the program, but just to give you a little bit of background on who I am and where I come from and what I stand on, that certainly is it. I stand on our history. I stand on that, you know, we are still enslaved. We are not free. And we are never going to be free until we are all free. So this is not a fight that Black folks alone can handle. This is not a fight that we are going to win without allies, allies that don't look like us. We were freed through the Underground Railroad through allies. It was right. not just us, right? <laughs> like we don't even make up 13% of the population. So you know that if there's going to be true change in this country, it has to be all of us coming together to work together. And we know what drives change in this country. It's economic gain and benefit. You start hitting white powerful folks in the pockets where it matters, and then you'll start to see change. And historically, that's the way it's always been. So that's why it's so important for us to know our history so that we can come together and organize properly and devise an effective plan for change.
Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Um, I just want to put this out there. I know that we're having some kind of technical difficulties and I've been working on my end, but I'm recording this so it will be um, um, recorded and placed on the um, site on the page later on. So I want to move on to the next person who is Lisa Riley. Hi, Lisa. Lisa, unmute yourself. Hi. Hi, hi. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really, really starstruck. And you know, I've all of you are amazing people. And uh, for days, I've just been like, wow. A lot of you I, I've read about, I've seen you on lives, just amazing people. But uh, a little bit about me, I have Breaking Silence with Prison Reform and then also the Growth Hour, which um, Mr. Clift, or I'm sorry, Mr. James Jones and Mr. Maurice Clifton, um, has asked me to come aboard there. And Mr. James Jones is the Reinvention Center. Mr. Maurice Clifton is Sale of Sippy. And, um, and I'm also, I, I, I'm an advocate for two people currently right now. I'm barely new at this within a year. So um, I'm, I'm learning, I'm, I'm trying to absorb all I can. Um, you know, I personally get a lot of flack from a lot of different people because you know I here's my thing um, I have beautiful children and grandchildren and a husband of color and it's very important to me that no policeman kills my grandchildren it's, and I know that's possible and I need to I need to jump on board and I need to do what I can do to be there for them, to educate them. And I can't do that in, unless I'm educated myself. So um, the Reverend, please thank you for, for the words of education because that is so important um, for all of us. And I, and I be, truly believe in that. So, you know, and I, I really believe that if we come together and, um, you know, in work together, we can do this, we can make changes, and we have to because we're all human beings, you know, and, and that's the bottom line. We need to be treated as humans. Yeah. And, uh, you know, on, on a daily basis, I get people in, uh, in my messenger and sending me message pleading to help them because there's uh, loved ones are being abused, they're being beaten. And, uh, and a step further, I have a mother that uh, federal prison killed her son and um, you know and there has to be a change I, I don't have the answers but I, I'm hoping to continue to uh, learn and grow and, and take something from each and every one of you and apply that so uh, thank you so much for allowing me to be here thank you thank you so much Lisa so the next person I want to introduce is uh, where well, I want her to introduce herself is Allie um, come on, Allie, come in. Are you, is your mic on? Hi. Hello. Thank you for having me. Uh, I, my name is Allie. I am an activist with Michigan Liberation, also accountability for Dearborn. I'm in this fight because what is happening to Black people is not right. Also in this fight because a woman's body is not a group discussion. Mm -hmm. And I feel like what is going on in this country, it is, it's just, the American way. As sad as that sounds, this is what America has been about. There's no morals. It's all about just putting people behind bars. Mm -hmm. And I'm tired of seeing so many, knowing so many people that know somebody that's in jail or had a family member that came out of jail or like someone that got arrested. It's just way too common and it's not right at all. And as well as uh, qualified immunity, the way it, it, allow so many people to get by with doing so many bad things is unbelievable and it has to stop yes I'm we're at a place where right now we have the momentum we yeah. have to use this momentum people are coming together now because everything where whether it's politics whether it's, it's racial issues uh whether it's gender people are coming together but we have to remember that there's not gonna always be times when we had a spotlight it's gonna be some pretty dark times in this fight and it's not gonna happen overnight and right now, while we have the momentum, we have to know that 
a lot of change is going to happen in this short amount of time or a lot of tragedy that's going to lead to the change. You know, there's decades that happens in weeks and that's where we're at right now. Yeah. So we need to take advantage of it. Right. Thank you so much. And next, um, last but not least, <laughs> Tia Taylor. Hi, Tia. <laughs> I think you need to unmute yourself. You, we can't hear you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Tia. There we go. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Tell us who you are and what you do. And Oh, I just want to say thank you so much, Janice. I call you J-Love, and that is definitely true. You have so much love. And for you to have such a fight in you during this time is so important. I am so pleased to be a part of this panel. Uh, I've been in mental health for, oh my goodness, over 30 years. I am a candidate now for a doctoral degree. Mm -hmm. And right now I am sitting on a board um, for Flint, helping to change looking at what actually began uh, the lead poisoning and the um, all the marginalization that has happened out in Flint and for those children. Mm -hmm. And so I'm on a task force so that it doesn't happen again. But at the same time, I am standing behind you and everyone else 100% for wrongful convictions because all it has impacted everyone i don't know any african-american who has not been a part or had to deal with with this mm -hmm. and um, i was talking to my sons the other day having twin boys and having to talk to them early when they're two and three and five years old to prepare them on how they have to operate out in this community and i'm at the point now where we should be saying and not another one right no more no more, Not, you don't get any more sons, you don't get any more daughters. And I know that that is going to happen with us coming together and staying united. Yes. Staying united. And of course, edu you know, they, you, everyone has talked about education and, and I agree. Uh, I stand <laughs> with Malcolm X when, when they asked him, if you had to do it all over again, what would you do? And he said, before I organize, I would educate, yeah. educate the people. And I, and I think that's where we are. So I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, and I know that we are ahead of the game more than we have ever been before. Yes. Yes. And, and um, I, I'm from the understanding that those that's closer to the problem can help fix the problem. So that's why we're all here together because we're, we're the ones that got the boots on the ground. We're living it every day. Mm -hmm. So I want to go into the panel discussion with everyone. Um, thank you uh, for those introductions. Um, let's talk about um, what is wrong for conviction? Mm -hmm. um, how did it start? And um, the history of it. And I want to start um, with Hakeem. If you want to uh, start it off, just talking about um, what is wrong for convictions. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I, I think to start this question out with a, a very pinpointed definitive answer, we have to state this clearly that what we call wrongful convictions today essentially amounts to historical legal conviction. Meaning that in the United States of America, Blacks and others that were removed from citizenship never had legal rights. So they never had the, the full ability to contest charges, mm -hmm. right? So even when charges were brought that were true, whether they were true or false, it didn't matter from a legal point of view because black people had no legal standing to challenge accusations, That's right? right? So we have to put that in context to understand the criminal legal system and how it evolved to continue to create a system that processes uh, mm -hmm. black bodies into the system right. by a, a criminal legal prosecution system that starts with uh, an arrest whether rightful or wrongful, 
African Americans still even today really have no real legitimate legal standing, which is why, for example, when you look at the criminal legal system, you have to have a bar, like uh, Victoria mentioned, you have to have a bar to practice law. So mm -hmm. generally speaking, when you step into the court of law, you do not have the right to defend yourself. You have to relegate that or allegate that to someone else who has legal standing to speak for you in the courtroom. So mm -hmm. all those things are critical when it comes to talk about wrongful convictions and the proliferation of black bodies and people of color in the legal system and why, mm -hmm. why it's, it's disproportionate. Right. So a simple definition of a wrongful conviction is, of course, when someone who ha has been convicted of a crime that they were not actually guilty of, mm -hmm. that is a wrongful conviction. And so, mm -hmm. like I said, placing it in a perspective of understanding that the legal system designed itself to really remove the opportunity for people to be able to really defend themselves, to, to redress mm -hmm. charges. I mean, it created a, 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 a system in which it's what we call a no-win situation, right? Mm -hmm. There's a no-win situation. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes when we do encounter the, the, the legal system, even with an attorney, even with support and perhaps private mm -hmm. investigators and even with the truth on your side, we yeah. can find ourselves convicted of a crime that we are actually innocent of. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully that kind of gives a little definition because I, you know, as it, it, radical as I am in, in my philosophy and thinking, you know, um, it's critical for me to continue to remain consistently radical and, 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 and reaching to the sources of these issues and topics because too often we speak about them in, from a present point of view of how we're impacted by the present system, but the present system in itself is an antebellum system created in a way that we, that we call broken today, but it was created and designed to function in the way it functions today. So it actually functions adequately, successfully, it's producing mass incarceration, yeah. it's keeping people enslaved in America, mm -hmm. and so it's functioning correctly. And we have to figure out a way to break that system. Mm -hmm. Tia? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I was looking at the fact that um, with, <laughs> with wrongful convictions, the thing is, is we have to know that we have political power and we have got to get to these attorneys, to the prosecuting attorneys and change what is happening because we stand as the person who is hiring. We actually hire the people to kill us. Mm. And we don't look at it like that. Mm. We are putting people in office. And, and there are a lot of times people are voting and putting people in office and they're just going willy nilly. I, I never, I have talked to people sometimes and I said, did you even research on the person? And they don't research. And that's why we have to speak. We have to, we have to vote. Not only that, but we have to educate the people so they know who to vote for mm -hmm. and, and let them know. What is the report card on that person? What are they doing to our community? Are they, are they beneficial for us or are they coming after us? Right. You know, so we, we can make a change. Yes. Reverend Pinkney, can you uh, talk about the history of wrongful conviction? Reverend Pinkney? All right. Um, you know, I think our brother Hakeem summed it up he did. Um, <laughs> very, very well uh, because this system was designed to do what it's doing. And when you look at how with these wrongful convictions, the consistent pattern that takes place um, inside our courtrooms. Our courtrooms are like, I don't even know what to call them. Um, I call Frank Murphy the Frank Murphy Hall of Injustice, right? right. Um, because I, I, I'll tell you this story very quickly. Today, I got a call from the prosecutor's office who told me that after three and a half months of um, investigating a little old white lady who ran through our protest, that they were gonna charge her with two misdemeanors. And I couldn't believe it, right? Cause they had a video, they had everything they needed. And so I just told her, I said, ma'am, on wrongful conviction day, let me tell you something. I said, I court watched the case 
where a prosecutor from your office withheld video from a trial that sent two men to prison for six years. The retrial comes, now the tapes pop in and one guy is released and the other guy is still there. You tell me, what are you doing for the people? And she said, oh, you're hollering at me. I said, no, I'm not hollering at you. I'm holding you accountable. Yeah. And this is what we have to do. See, when you think about freedom, right? And mm -hmm. I think uh, my sister Victoria said this, that we're not free until we're all free. Right. We got so comfortable because after the civil rights movement, we got trinkets. We got trinkets, we got little stuff, we got houses, we got cars, we got all these things that we equated to freedom, not knowing that these people were rocking us to sleep so we would stop the fight. Mm -hmm. So where we were fighting for civil rights instead of fighting for human rights, right? Mm -hmm. Now we sit in this position 40, 50 some years later, still in the same doggone place. And I, I said this the other day, our elders, some of them have dropped the ball. They've dropped the ball. So now we've got to pick it up and assume the position so that our children don't have to fight this fight that we are fighting. And I'll tell you something, it is something that can be done because like our sister Tia said, we have power, right. but we don't understand it. Right. We have the power of our voices united. We have the power of our vote. And then we got to open up the door to holding these individuals accountable and letting them know that if you don't do what we, the people say, you won't hold these seats. Right. But we got to get to that point where we pressure people enough to do the right thing because they're not going to do it just because it's right. Or they would have done it a long time. Yeah. Victoria. Again, I'm going to take us back to when we first landed here. Yeah. We were killed and hung in streets for people to stare. If it was even said that we looked at a white person the wrong way, if we didn't answer to a right per the white person the wrong, if we didn't answer the right way to a white person, mm -hmm. wrongful convictions have been happening since we got here. Yes. Our lives have never been valued. And so when you look at how we lit, how we were lynched and we're continued this day, you know, we continue to be lynched. Mm -hmm. um, there are, I can't remember his name, but I remember I cried so hard this summer when a man was executed for a crime he didn't commit and everyone knew it. Everyone knew it in that state that that black man didn't commit that crime. Mm -hmm. Everyone across the country fought hard for him to no avail. So when you talk about the history of wrongful convictions, you got to go all the way back to when we got here, yeah. the days of lynching. And then you have to acknowledge how we are still lynching our people in this system. Mm -hmm. And no, it's no longer just white folks. Mm -hmm. Someone said, I think it was uh, Reverend Pinkney, that lawyers are, are participating in this. Mm -hmm. And it's not just prosecutors, mm -hmm. it's defense attorneys. It's disgusting. If you are either appointed to a case or retained on a case to immediately encourage your client, oh, just take a plea. Yeah. No, baby, no. Yeah. I tell my clients a whole slew of rules when they come in my office to interview me. I tell them I'm not your mama, I'm not your priest, and I'm not God. And I don't care what it is that you did or did not do. That's not my job. Mm -hmm. My job is to ensure that the government proves beyond a reasonable doubt that your freedom should be taken from you. Right. And that's all I'm here to do. And I'm not going to do that by asking you on day two of representing you as your lawyer, oh, just take a plea. Right. I don't even know what the evidence is that the government has against you. Right. I haven't even began to poke holes in the case that the government has against you. And so until you look at body cams, until you look at recorded interviews, until you look at autopsy reports, until you've had your own investigator go out and look at the scene of a crime and talk to witnesses, speak to your client's family to understand who your client is, because that's so important. You got to know the story behind the man. 
because in, until you know that, it is easy, I imagine, for some attorneys to just say, oh, just take a plea, because you don't know this person. Right. Hold the hand of your client. I'm, I'm a very touchy-feely, emotional, lovey-dovey person. I hold my client's hands. If you Google me, you'll see there's a photo from some news media outlet where I'm walking out of Frank Murphy crying with my client holding his hand. We had just gotten a ruling that he, he was 19 at the time. He had shot out the front window of his home at two police officers, not knowing that they were police officers. He thought that they were people trying to break into his home because he had just had his home broken into two nights before that. And he thought he was protecting his mother and little brother as the man of the house. And the uh, judge in district court saw fit to bind my client over for trial after a preliminary exam where officers took the stand and it was very clear that this should not have been bound over to a jury. Um, and I think the judge even knew it and was just trying to toe the line. I have respect for that judge. I just did not agree with that decision. And I was angry about it. And when I get angry, I cry. And my client was distraught and fearful. And so we walked out together, sharing that pain and that experience as best we could, because I'll never walk in his shoes. And I know that. And I don't take that for granted. So I try to get as close to the people that are living with that pain as possible so that I can understand the gravity of my, my actions and I take them seriously. That is how you start to combat from where I sit as a defense attorney, wrongful convictions, by not asking the client to begin with to roll over and plead guilty to something that they didn't do. Now, does that come with a price sometimes? Absolutely, absolutely. And that's, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate that I have to tell my clients, if we don't take this deal, which I don't think is necessarily a good deal, then the other option is to go before a jury who was not possibly going to be a jury of your peers. And you're taking a risk. And you may be convicted. And that conviction may stand until I can get you in front of a court of appeals panel mm -hmm. or in front of a Supreme Court panel to fight the case using the law there because we know that this system is upheld by people. And we know that you won't always, like Reverend Pinckney said, you won't always win at the trial level. And you know, you can't control a jury. Um, I will never forget how shocked I was. I represented a pregnant uh, environmental activist some years ago. And I just knew that the jury was not gonna convict her. She was charged with, um, some gun crimes because she pointed a gun at another woman who was trying to run her over with a car and her mother and her two-year-old child were right there on the scene with her, all in danger. And she didn't fire her gun. The gun didn't even have any bullets in it, she said. She simply pointed the gun as a deterrent so this woman would stop attacking her family with a car vehicle. Right. And she was pregnant when we took that case to trial. She was seven months pregnant. And I just knew I just knew that that jury with some black folks on it, younger folks, older folks, that they would not convict her and understand her fear as a black mother and mama in that moment. But they did convict her. And I cried in that, cried that day. I cried when we went back to court on the record and I begged the judge. I gave him my legal arguments grounded in the law and then at the very end, I just did a, a full emotional plea. Please, please allow my client to either self-report after she delivers her child or allow her to um, remain out on bond. The judge denied both requests. He took her into custody immediately at her sentencing. She delivered her baby shackled in chains outside of Huron Valley Women's Prison. She now is the reason why we have legis legislation banning chained women during delivery, during any kind of a medical procedure or receiving treatment. Mm -hmm. So, <sighs> when I tell you that for lawyers, and I don't know how many lawyers are watching, I don't know how many people are watching that intend to go to law school, I know Trisha certainly does. You can't be afraid to get too close to your client and their lives and their story. 
you got to know when you have someone coming in your office and you ask them where they live, that you got to ask where they've lived for the last 10 years. Because what you may see is that they've in the last 10 years had 10 different residences. That tells you that there's some instability in their lives. That tells you that there's possibly some unresolved, unaddressed trauma. That tells you that whether they did it or not, you got to dig deeper and find out who they are and why they are the way that they are. That will compel you to fight your ass off, whether they're guilty or not. Because sometimes our people don't even have a fighting chance from the start. And I firmly believe that even if people commit a wrong act, that they don't always deserve to have their livelihood and liberty taken from them. And I certainly think that the worst thing that anybody working within the carceral state can do and support is to play a part, any part, big or small, in the incarceration of an innocent person. You hurt everybody. You hurt the wrongfully convicted person. You hurt their family. You hurt the victims who will never seek or receive true justice because the system has decided to set sights on somebody that didn't even do it and they just want that conviction. You hurt the family of that victim. You hurt the community at large. Wayne County has more wrongful convictions than all other counties combined. Yes. Michigan is a problem when it comes to wrongful convictions. What are we going to do about it? We can't just put it on prosecutors. We can't, I I told you, I I dismiss the police. I have no hope for them. I know that I can control what I do in my role as a defense attorney and as an advocate. And that's, that's what I've chosen to do. And I have to have a firm handle on our history in order to do it. Because without that, folks will run into someone who may have done exactly what they've been charged with, but they haven't even began to look and understand the reason why to say, you may have done this, but your intention wasn't there. Your, your, your experience and your mindset um, is, you didn't have that required, that requisite intent to be held criminally responsible. And so I got to fight like hell for you, whether you did it or not, because in my mind, you still don't deserve to be convicted. You deserve for someone to invest in you, to pour into you. And that's, that's what I got. Right. Wow. I know when we talk about reform, um, what you said triggered me uh, about the whole person, looking at the whole person, um, understanding um, it's not about law and order, but it's about truth and justice. And when we get that truth and justice, we'll have more empathy and compassion for people. And we can um, eliminate all these things, uh, traumas. We can help people with their traumas. So thank you, um, Attorney um, Harris. I want to move on to um, Lisa. Boy, I wish uh, I knew you, Attorney Paris, years ago. Um, I'd, I'd like to share with you my husband's wrongful conviction. Um, and I'm in Ohio, and he was, um, he got a charge, a drug charge. But at the time, the Attorney General um, was running for governor, Mike DeWine, and he, he needed a big case. So, um, and he found, he found my husband and, and he put this drug case on him, which nothing was true. We weren't even in the state at the time that he accused him of selling these drugs. Um, but yet, Mike DeWine had made many, many commercials after my husband was convicted, holding up his case log saying war on drugs. So he based his, uh, his whole campaign on convicting my husband so it's so i believe it's so important to vote but i believe it's so important to also investigate and read into these people and find out because unfortunately mike dewine won governor and ohio is a mess you know um yeah i'm I'm sure you've seen judges are coming out left and right um being uh, we find out they're uh 
taking bribes and uh you know and and it's it's just happening all over the place attorneys and you know so uh, mike dewine right now is being investigated um he's you know i, I don't want to make this a slander on him but um he was wrong and, and he lied and i know he did uh, now when my husband was incarcerated he's currently taking um the paralegal program and he's studying hard and he's educating himself and he's going to come home and uh, he's going to prove that he was innocent and um and it'll be a major lawsuit so you know i think we we have to again we have to educate ourselves on so many different levels um yes it's great we have to vote we have to vote we have to get the right people in there but i i think that we have to uh investigate on who is the right people and having these types of platforms are so important again it is so important to come together and um and talk and get everything out there um and especially coming from from different states yeah. so uh, and and again i i appreciate everything everyone is saying so um but, um, and you know, uh, prison reform for me, I just want people to, uh, to be treated as human beings, mm -hmm. you know, and you know, you could be completely, you know, you could have done that crime. You know, there are, I understand there's people in prison that did do crimes and they go to prison, but why, why can't they be treated like a human being? Right. You know, that, that is my point. I can't figure out how it is that, that these guards and these wardens get in these positions. And then once they're in these positions, why is it okay for them to hit them with objects? I, I don't understand that. You know, I have pictures and I have videos that are sent to me all the time, you know, where, where they shut off the water and, and they're not allowed to have water and they're, they're, they're not allowed to have food. Laura Winsel, she went 45 days, they refused to feed her in solitary. Yes, she has, they beat her to the point where she was on life support. They knew for sure in their minds that she would never make it, that she would die. But this is how good God is. She lived, uh, you know, the warden wrote a letter which Laura Winslow has today. Laura Winslow has been free. She was released four months ago and she has a letter from the warden to the hospital stating they will not pay to take her off a of life support immediately. Mm -hmm. God was so good, it pulled her through. She was released, has all her paperwork, and she will file uh, major lawsuits against them. They abused her so bad, you know, and, and I don't understand why is this allowed? How, how can we stop this? How can we end this? You know, um, and I don't, I always have to say, because people always, again, you know, they send me messages, you do the crime, you pay, or you do the crime, you do the time. Well, but they're human beings. I, you know, to me, it just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't, it, I don't understand it. And again, I am in Ohio. Uh, Marion Correction, where my husband is, was a major hot spot. Every, every last prisoner in that facility got COVID, including my husband, everyone. And there was two deaths in the staff. And they did nothing. Like they gave them nothing. And they, it was almost like they left them there to die. You know, no sanitation. I would call and I'd do everything I'd have to do. And, and I would call her, they'd give us a little hotline number and I'd call and say, hey, there's no sanitation. She'd say, oh yeah, yeah, you know, that everything's being cleaned every net. No, no. My husband laid in a dorm of 103 men and they cleaned, they would come in and clean the bathroom once a month. Wow. There, there were men that could not get up and, the, and this is factual stuff that's going on and and now inside these prisons they're getting uh well i know in ohio they they won't give them their mail which i think it's it i i think on a federal level i don't think they're allowed to do this but when i mail a letter 
my husband's not going to get it. They're going to photocopy it. They're going to shred the original because they feel the drugs are coming in through the mail. And I, and I laugh at that because it's the guards. It's the guards bringing the drugs in. It's the guards bringing COVID in. It's the guards that are selling cell phones for a thousand bucks a pop. It's the guards. Wow. And then it's also the guards, the words that are allowing them to abuse, physically beat these people. You know, I don't understand, and it's happening in Ohio where they will handcuff you, and then they'll and then they'll decide to to hit you or, or kick you. What I mean, what is that? A, I, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know the answers. I just had to get that out. So thank you for listening. But I, I'm hoping. Uh, hopefully some changes will come. Um, Thank you, Lisa. So, Allie, uh, could you, do you have anything about the history of wrongful conviction? Yes, um, I definitely agree. Uh, uh, Victoria, you do have to go back to the beginning to really understand it. Um, mm -hmm. If you go back to, you know, post-slavery, so when you think of Black codes, you are paying a debt for being enslaved. You're never let go from that system. And then you fast forward to now, and those that are released are paying fees in different debts. And when you are wrongfully convicted, you're not everybody that is wrongfully convicted is compensated, is one. Mm -hmm. some, some states compensate people more than the other. Uh, only what, uh, there's still 15 states that haven't made it where people are compensated and you don't get social services. Mm -hmm. There's only like one of those I know about. So it's like they're setting you up for hopelessness. Right. Behind bars, you, it's, it's, you're there in a way, prison is set up in a way in which you are uh, helpless. You're behind bars. Who's like to try to get someone out of prison, to try to get their case clear, to get them the right lawyer, whatever. It is extremely difficult. Helplessness. Coming out of prison. You're wrongfully convicted. You didn't do anything. You don't get compensated or any social benefits. Now you're hopeless mm -hmm. because all this time you spent in prison, you get out and it's nothing like you thought it would be. You have no direction. Even those that are uh, released from prison after doing their time, they're set up with what some things, minimal, minimal, but they're set up with uh, checking in with someone because they have to, about getting a job, like constantly. It's like, once you're released, they have that, which is very minimal. You're wrongfully convicted. You don't have any of that guidance going back into life for something, after being in prison for something you did not do. You're old and they owe you a debt and they're not paying it. And instead you're paying a debt. Right. Mentally, you're paying that debt. Physically, you're paying that debt because you're you are nowhere near what you would have been by being out of prison. Right. Thank you, Allie. Um, I have a message, everyone. I want to play. Hi, everyone. It's Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib. I want to take a moment and thank Mother Janice and so many others that have been sharing their incredible stories of wrongful conviction and the emotional toll it has had on their families. I want to also take a moment in understanding that right now our systems are broken, that systemic racism is not only in our corrections and judicial system, but it's also impacting the economic divide and the broken systems of healthcare, education, and so much more. So I wanna take a moment and thank all of you for your incredibly important work. And thank you for being vulnerable. Thank you for sharing and fighting back against wrongful convictions. We need your voice and we need to make sure that we put a human face again to these broken systems and truly end mass incarceration and truly end systemic racism in our country. So thank you, Mother Janice, for leading the way. And thank you all to the mothers and to the uncles and sons and daughters and sisters that I've heard from. Thank you again for inspiring me to work even harder. Thank you, from Rashida. Um, I just wanted to, um, as we go forward, I wanted to post, um, what can we do now 
to help remedy um, stop wrongful convictions. Um, I know we've been talking about qualified immune, uh, immunity, and as well as um, uh, we have uh, the expungement thing um, um, coming up. I want Hakeem to talk about a little bit to explain to us, but what can we do as individuals um, to um, help um, in? I, I would suggest one is educate. And um, I have taken on that platform since Gerard um, wrongful conviction is to make sure that I do my job to um, spread the word about wrongful convictions and to educate others because people uh, first thoughts that they have when you start talking about it is, oh, well, he must have did something or they had to do something. So as a mother and an advocate, I think it's important, like was mentioned uh, at many times, is to educate our community, our families, our loved ones, to make sure that they understand how these things happen. It's not that you had to do anything. So um, I want you guys, um, I'm going to start with uh, Trisha. Um, if she's, um, what could we do, Trisha? Okay, I'll see what you say. So we'll start with you, Allie. <laughs> I'm okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my apologies. There no. we yes. are. Oh, oh, hey, okay. hey, hold on, I am hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> hold on. We're going to introduce you as soon as Allie sure. finishes. Okay, <laughs> go ahead, Allie. Uh, yes. Um, okay, we need to start making it where uh, learning about the system, learning about uh, different different type of crimes and and or what they label as crimes. Learn about different scenario situations. We didn't make that the norm. So uh, there's a lot of things in school they don't teach you. Obviously, doing your taxes is one of the most important things. They don't teach that. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> We need to make it where we make we are teaching the youth about those kind of things, right. whether it's uh, the juvenile system, whether it's rape cases, whether it is murder cases, uh, whether it is uh, uh, drug cases. Um, prosecutors and police officers, a lot of the misconduct that they do contribute to wrongful convictions happens in murder cases and drug cases. Right. We need to start learning about those things that are most common to prevent those things from happening to us. We also need to learn about uh, the different caseloads that lawyers have. Uh, a lot of the time, our cases that may go over their counter is just paperwork. It's not paid attention to as much as it should because they're being overworked. We also need to know about, um, a, you know, as evidence comes along from the other side, we need to immediately get a hold of it. We need to keep those things in mind. You can keep the wheels turning in your brain. Um, with these kind of things. Start paying attention to cases that go national, uh, things, even if it's not pertaining to you, this is a fight that involves all of us. Right. And it can happen to anybody because incarceration has become the norm and it has been the norm for so long. Mm -hmm. um, we also need to, we can't take for granted that we can vote prosecutors in. Not all countries allow that. That's not a normal thing that just around the world does. So we need to take advantage of having that. Mm -hmm. and learning about these judges, learning about the power that they truly have. Right. So I just, I want to um, break away for two seconds because Gabe came in and I want him to introduce himself and um, Gabe, um, turn on your mic and let, introduce yourself and tell us what it is that you do because everybody don't know. Okay, all right. First of all, I am so sorry for being late. My alarm went off, my reminder alarm went off and about 30 minutes late. It was like, oh no, but <laughs> I am here. Uh, yes, my name is Gabriel Romo. I've designed the innocent flag that represents and supports uh, all innocent people behind bars around the world. And I, one thing that I guess I, 
I'm on the awareness side of things as far as getting word out, getting uh, people to know about the holes in the system. And because um, I come, I come from uh, an upbringing that I wasn't aware of it. I lived in a blissful free country where the justice system uh, only got bad guys. And if you weren't guilty, you had nothing to worry about. And after following the Innocence Project and uh, a bunch of other cases, I learned that things needed things uh, needed to change and people needed to be aware of it. So I'm more um, I'm looking into like different ways of how to get awareness out there. For for one, uh, obviously the rallies are what rallies and protests are what uh, a lot of people do, which is really really good. Um, but I believe that signs and something physical that people can actually see will um, will be something that we can add to uh, uh, the movement as far as getting awareness out there. Like, well, for one, obviously the, the innocent flag, but I would say the innocent flag is only just a part of it as far as getting awareness out there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like my ideal image as far as helping raise awareness for like specific cases would be an innocent flag, but more importantly, a sign with just a simple phrase that says, um, so-and-so is innocent. And I've gone around uh, the country and I'll, I'll make a sign and I'll go and support someone who is innocent at, behind bars and I'll, I'll hold the flag. And I've learned that that is very, very, uh, effective. Yeah. Um, it's even more effective when someone's standing with it, but there's so many cars that drive by and uh, we can't like quit our jobs and rally and protest all the time. So when we have a sign that speaks 24 seven, it reaches a lot more people than we know. Yeah. And I believe that that is just, that's one more aspect that I'm focusing on adding to the movement to raise awareness. Um, so yes. So can you give us a little bit of history of, you, of the flag? You know. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was following a case where um uh, a guy went in prison, and he was in there for ten years before he got out. And during that time, I was that that was like the first case. I was like, what in the world's going on here? Mm -hmm. And it. I followed it for 10 years, but within that 10 years, a close friend of mine uh, went to jail and I saw like how the case was like messed up and set up and just didn't, they weren't looking for justice. They weren't looking for truth. They were looking for a conviction. And I was like, what? And um, we lost the case and I was like, I was like, what in the world? So I was so mad, you can't really have any words for it, that I just went on the computer. I was gonna scroll through Facebook and see if I could just find something else to think about. And that's when uh, I saw another case of an innocent person who went to, to prison. And that night, the image of the innocent flag uh, came to me. I don't know if you can, uh, can you hear me right now? Oh yeah, well, I can hear okay. you. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, awesome. <laughs> so that's when the I got up early the next morning, and I was like sketching it out on paper. I'm like, I have to get this image, and then I'm not the techiest of people, so I had my friend uh, digitalize it, mm -hmm. and I'm like, no, that's not it. So I draw it a little bit more, and we went back and forth for a couple months, and then. We tweaked it for a couple of years and I had just uh, got it, recently just got it like copywritten and all that like paperwork stuff. So it is the, it's a legit sign for the symbol of the innocent people behind bars. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. Thank yeah. you for that. Um, I didn't get it uh, mine yet. Okay, it's in the mail. It's on the I'm way. I'm going to post it as soon as it comes. <laughs> All um, right. <laughs> thank you, Gabe. Um, I want to go, go ahead. If I could say one more thing. So yeah. when you get your flag, yeah. when you get your flag, 
um, put your flag up, but don't just put your flag up. Put your son's name, like under the flag or somewhere where, where people can relate that image and that flag to that specific case. Yeah, awesome. And, uh, I will. I will. That will speak twenty four seven. Yes. Uh, I'm gonna go to Hakeem. Um, Mr. Crampton, can you just talk to us about what uh, we can do to um, stop wrongful convictions? Um, what is your suggestions? What is it? And also, as you speak about that, can you also talk about the expungement? Yeah. So let me start on the back end to connect it to the front end. Okay. Uh, the back end, which refers to uh, felony um, expungement, which Drew Allen was referring to earlier uh, about the fact that he had two or three felony convictions, was only entitled to get one uh, set aside, and therefore still had two, and you know, what benefit would it really do? And so, you know, the premise behind the criminal legal system's uh, incarceration, use of uh, penitentiary, um, was designed, of course, to hold a person accountable, or I don't want to say it was designed to do that. It was uh, philosophically written that that's the, the gist behind incarceration is to hold people accountable and connected it to, of course, the Philadelphia prison system in, it, in itself, to the penitentiary, to be able to turn and penance to God for the crimes that the individual committed because the individual didn't just commit a crime against society and create uh, um, a situation in which society is no longer safe, but what that individual originally was accused of, and which the reason the gist for penitentiary is because an individual had committed a sin against God, mm -hmm. right? The sin was committed against God, and that person needed to repent and return to God to return to righteousness, so to speak. And after a return to God and the repentance, then the, the, the fellowship, so to speak, accepted the person back uh, into the fold, into the flock. You, you've been redeemed, right? Mm -hmm. That's the gist behind the criminal justice system's usage of incarceration, such that when a person is so-called redeemed or released from incarceration, return to society, having completed the terms of the judges or the court's adjudication, that person is considered redeemed, which is the usage today of what is called an expungement, right? Yeah. But we know that because the criminal system was created the way it was designed, it was never designed to really give us actual freedom so that there was no real freedom was the outcome. Freedom is not the outcome uh, uh, of, of, uh, of, of an adjudicated sentence, right? So that, you know, you're sentenced to 10 years, and once you complete your 10 years, you're free. That's not how the system is really designed. The system is really designed to keep you in the system. There is no expungement for you because we're going to consistently hold you accountable for the rest of your life for the crimes that we convicted you of, no matter how well you've been redeemed, right? right. So we have to pivot that as a conversation to talk about what do we do about wrongful convictions. The reason we have to pivot that in the conversation is because we have to raise and elevate that to the level to where we are talking about when educating our people, talking about breaking that system. Right. So, so the conversation about what do we do, we break that system, right? We have to break the carceral system's usage of its legalisms. We have to break the legal structure, which begins with policing. It begins with how police are, are authorized to detain bodies, right? To, to have the, the, the full authority to detain a body without the adjudication of a court right? They still have that power. That's why they use the bail system, because the bail system, according to them, assures that your safe return back to court. Right. That's not really its real gist. The real gist is allegedly that you are such a, a threat to society that we need to impose um, a, a financial uh, a surety upon your body, right? Because you're a threat to society. Not that, you know, and so people who get released on bail, are they any more or less of a threat upon release? So the bail is not really used as justification because it's a threat to society, unless, for example, a person is accused of killing five or 10 people, went on wanton disregard for human life, shoot out with the law enforcement, got placed into custody, and they're asking the judge, hey, this individual is a threat to society. We don't think they should be out right now. 
Right. But if you get picked up for a rock of cocaine, you can't afford a thousand dollar bail. There's no way possible you should ever be detained. So my point once again is we have to challenge the system. We have to be bold, audacious. We have to be revolutionary and challenge the criminal legal system, right? We have to be holding our police departments accountable. We have to be holding our prosecutors accountable. Face to face, we have to demand from them what we ask for. We're asking for justice. And that means oftentimes that we're asking them to resign, to step out of the way so that someone else can take the place. Someone like Victoria can be in the place who understands the criminal legal system and can dismantle it from within. Because you can't dismantle it from within simply because you want to be a good police officer and you're going to do good. Every contact you have with someone, you're going to treat them fairly. Well, that's just you and your own individual capacity. Your individual capacity is limited. It's really based upon that system that controls your individual capacity. So that means that if Victoria had won the election to become Wayne County's prosecutor, she would have been in power over the system and not one of the, for example, prosecutors in the system. She's the head prosecutor in charge of the system that we need to break, right? Mm -hmm. So therefore she could have dismantled it from within. So that's the type of steps that we need to take as a real revolutionary, aggressive tactic to how we're going to address the criminal legal system that is based upon racism, institutional structural racism that must be broken. There's no other way, but it must be broken. Mm -hmm. Allie? You said you wanted to add something? Yes. Um, just, you know, hearing him talking about being revolutionary, being bold, you know, one thing I definitely wanted to mention, we got to stop talking about just reforming it. Right. It's changing it, redoing it. Right. People don't like to hear that word abolish, but everything we're talking about now is about abolishing it. Yeah. So we have to defund the police. That has to happen. If they truly care about the community and want to, Say they're trying to keep us safe and all of this, you know, then they'll put more funds into the community. Right. Dearborn, for example, 43% of the budget is reserved for the police officers. And that is not right. right. We have to start challenging these departments, these city council people in, in our com small communities, and then uh, broaden that completely out. You know, wrongful convictions, that's the other side. The right. entry area is the police officers. Right. Prosecutors and the police, biggest contributors to wrongful convictions. Right. We got to do it on both ends. Right. Especially when you have cities like Detroit that um, approves facial recognition, and you know that that is biased. We know that is racist. We have um, cities all over the United States that's getting rid of it, and then you approve it to surveillance um, eighty percent of your community, which is black, it is. Uh, this is another thing that leads to incarceration. So when you have people that vote for these kind of things, you have to eliminate them from office. You have to vote them off because they are working against you instead of for you. Trisha. She's, she's not even online anymore. Oh, okay, we'll go over to Tia. There we go. Hey. Hey, I did. <laughs> well, you know, I was I was sitting here and you know my I just get so into this. And the thing about it is that we're dealing with in Michigan alone, it's the it's is the most antiquated prison system in the world. Yes. And as a developed country, United States has the most incarcerations per capita. Yeah. The most people in prison. And we are the ones who prosecute the youth, try them as adults, not like any other country. So to me, as a developed country, we're acting as if we are not developed. And at some point, we have to address the ignorance of it all. Mm. And no one wants to talk about being ignorant. But this is, this is pure ignorance. You know, for, for people to behave in such a way, and the thing about it is, they're going according to a mental pattern that is in their mind, historically. Yes. Historically. Yeah. And they're continuing in that way. The sad thing about this is that as a people, 
we're responding with fear. That's why they, that's why they, they voted for facial recognition because they're running around afraid and they don't know, they, they have not been taught. You know, we're on it, we're not being educated either. Right. You know, in, in education, I'm not talking about book smart, I'm talking about just pure knowledge and wisdom that you get from the community. Mm -hmm. The other thing we need to do that's really going to fight it is economically, we have to come together with some economic power to back the people who are for us. And we have to know how to put our money where our votes need to go. And we're going to have to begin to reallocate monies to mm -hmm. come together for humanity. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, you know, because this. It's a black thing, but it's not just a black thing. Right. You know, it's it's people who who are in need. If you look at people who are being incarcerated, these are people. A lot of people who who are who are are economically at a disadvantage. Right. So we can do something, but it's gonna you know it's gonna take education. It's gonna take some economic power. Absolutely. Trisha. Uh, I saw yes, that. I apologize. No. I uh, had to switch. <laughs> <laughs> I see you in the car. Yeah, so um the question is what are what are we gonna do about it, right? Yeah. And there's no easy answer. There's no easy answer because if it was an easy answer, we wouldn't be dealing with it at all. Right. Um, sure. But what I do understand and know is that we need to mobilize. Mm -hmm. We need to organize. We need to do something that's hard for us to do as a people and stand together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We also need to be clear about what the agenda is. Okay. Yeah. You have when these movements start, you'll have the lowest hanging fruit, I call it, which people pick. The lowest hanging fruit is not always an answer to the plight of African Americans. It's always that easiest thing. So if you got ICE, deportation, um, if you have women's rights, if you have something else, people always seem to choose those um, fights. But when it comes to fighting for justice and these injustices that we face in this system, most people don't want to do it. And the reason why is because this giant looks so big. How do we fight something like this? We fight it together. Yeah. We fight together. We win together. Yeah. There's no other way. And we have to understand we are all different as a people. While we are one race, there are many different perspectives. But how do we bring that together in a collective and work for the greater good? Mm -hmm. And I if we lay down our own personal agendas, come together with a clear mission, then we can get some work done. Mm -hmm. We're not going to be able to uh, rid racism out of people's hearts, but we can doggone sure put laws in place that hold individuals accountable for stepping out of line. Mm -hmm. Stop being scared to challenge the status quo. Yes. I'm going to tell you something. I don't care nothing about your business as usual. We are interrupters to business as usual. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> That's what we need to do. We need to keep interrupting. We need to keep showing up. We need to keep having rallies. We need to keep protesting. We need to keep doing all of these things until we see change. Yeah. If we get that because something happens to one person and we come out, we rally, we march, and then we walk away, we're doing the injustice to the fight. Right. We got to play the course and do the after work. And I believe justice is going to come with the after work. Right. Because you can't find change in comfortability. You got to be uncomfortable. Very uncomfortable. Okay. Yes, I agree 100%. Uh, Lisa. <laughs> yeah, well, well. But I agree with everyone else, what everyone else has said. I, I, I truly believe it. it's, it's all about that dollar. I, I really, really do. And I think if we could come together 
and we and just like it's been said shift our money where it should go and, and you know um i know when mr floyd had lost his life uh, i had heard about a day where no one was going to spend any money and then i didn't hear any more about it you know and, and really that's no matter who you are what race you are it's really about the money mm -hmm. you know we came together and, and we made a choice like hey you know this is it we're not going to spend our money we're not going to do this. You have to listen. You have to make some changes. So I, I believe and agree with everything all of you are saying. I, I, I'm really truly thinking we are the team. Yeah. We can just going. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. Thank you, Lisa. Ali, what was you want to add? Yes. Uh, no. Um, Trisha, no, I agree with you about the, the agenda. The agenda's got to be clear. It's got to be clear. It's got to be clear because black people, we can get lost in this pool of just everything that's going on. Mm -hmm. People have to be okay with saying that this is about black lives. Mm -hmm. This is what this is about. If you stand for justice and want people to be free and have the best life in the world, then you should be okay fighting that fight. Mm -hmm. You should be okay pushing whatever you feel aside. Because when you look at the struggle and who's struggling the most in this country, you'll see that it is black people. Mm -hmm. And if black people aren't free, then nobody's free. If you liberate black people, then everybody is liberated yeah. because they're already put before us. Mm -hmm. They're already put in the front. So at the end of the day, we're going to be the ones liberated. So mm -hmm. that agenda, I just wanted to say that because that needs to be clear because yeah. there's a lot of people that seem to confuse that or, or, feel some type of way about that when our reality, if you look at the data and, and you look at the stories that people have told and you look at the family members, you can look at my mom, my grandmother, you can look at all that, then yeah. you know what fight you should be fighting. Right. Yep. And when we say Black Lives Matter, we're not saying that, you know, no one else's life doesn't matter. We're just saying because of our history, because right. our, our uh, experiences, because of um, where we come from or where, you know, or where we didn't, <laughs> we don't know where we came from. All of that is the reason why our lives matter. And we're not, um, so we're pushing this to the forefront. And when we see things like, you know, these high numbers of black people that's wrongfully in incarcerated. And when we see these things, uh, um, uh, inner city poverty that, you know, um, like in Detroit, like, you know, so many chi children wake up every day, you know, in poverty. This is the reason why we have to fight for justice. We can't be silent anymore. I wanted to bring uh, Hakeem back um, um, and see if he had anything he wanted to close with. He's not on. Oh, he's not on. Okay, cool. Um, so we're going to close out. Um, Tia. Tia. Tia, turn your mic. There we go. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> give us some inspiration to close out with. You know, I, I just was sitting here thinking that if we could get collectively every person in a community to give two dollars a month just a month <laughs> do you know how much money that would be towards a candidate or towards lobbying for what we want right. and we can increase that because i'm just saying that's just a small amount mm -hmm. But I am knowing that with this that we have right here, this is the beginning. And along with it, we have this mind in us that we can take to our homes and to our families and begin to just educate in our communities. And our community is our family and whoever we come in contact with so that we educate, but also inspire. Yeah. And, and remind people who they really are. Remind them of the power that they have inside of them. Remind them of true history. Remind them that they are not a mistake. 
remind them about their gifts, their talents, and their abilities, and, and, and get rid of the fear that has been brought about in our society and begin to be a people that walk by faith and not by sight, knowing that all things are still working together for our good, yes, no ma matter what. No matter what, we see the good still happening. I see the good still happening in my community. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I know it's going to happen. And I know it's going to happen because right here on this platform, we have one collective consciousness that is righteous for justice mm -hmm. for all people. And I know we make a difference. Absolutely. Thank you, Tia. We're going to end with that. And I appreciate you all for joining me. Um, I know there were some issues. Um, I'm going to tweak it out and we can do it again, maybe next month, or continue this conversation because I think the more we um, focus on um, the issue, the more we focus on the solution, the more we can solve the problem. We know what the problem is. Now it's about focusing on the solution, trying to get laws and policy changes so we can um, move forward and not have um, people, wrong, the innocent people like Gerard, wrongfully incarcerated, like Stefan, like um, um, Charities Fiance, like Drew. You know, we have to um, focus because no matter what, we all are one. So. I thank you guys. Love you all. And um, <laughs> I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you so much for putting this together. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.